Hello, here we go. More astronomy lectures. This is the second part of our discussion about the death of stars. So I think we ended last time talking about the death of massive stars, high mass stars, but not too, too massive. And that was as something called a neutron star. We also talked a little bit about remnants from supernova, but now we're going to get back to talking about neutron stars a little bit. Remember, this was after the sort of fusion lifetime of the star. It was a rather high mass star, greater than eight times the mass of our sun. Those kinds of stars are going to end up eventually being neutron stars, where the core had been turned into iron and then sort of collapsed because it couldn't keep fusing things anymore. The pressure just keeps dropping once you start to fuse iron. And so the core collapses in on itself and it gets so small that it crushes electrons into nuclei and everything forms into neutrons and you spit out a bunch of neutrinos. And the outer layer is all just blown away. Massive explosion. Right? Supernova, that was type 2 supernova. We'll talk a little bit more about some of the other types in this lecture as well. So this is an extremely dense object made of mostly neutrons, something like a hundred trillion times the density of water. If you recall, the white dwarfs ended at about like a million times denser than water, and these neutron stars are a hundred trillion times denser, give or take. That means, what is that? A thousand, another thousand, million, ten million times more dense than white dwarfs, which also means they get crushed down quite a lot. So we end up with something that's like 20 kilometers, whereas the white dwarfs were so like the size of a planet with Earth. And at such incredible densities, the material is just like pure neutron stuff. It'd be very odd to work with. Like if you had a cubic centimeter of material from a neutron star, it's like about a teaspoon, it would weigh about a billion tons. Yeah, quite a lot. But being so small, there's not a lot of surface area for the neutron star to give off light, so it doesn't put off very much. So if it's not very bright, not going to be easy to see. How do we see them? Oh, and just to remind you that stars ended up as this neutron star phase when they started out as actual stars that had about eight times the mass of the sun, or over that, but not quite that much bigger, right? So still less than about ten times the mass of the sun. Right? So between eight times sun's mass, 10 times the sun's mass, those are stars that are going to end up as neutron stars. We'll get to what happens when you get greater than 10 times the mass of the sun a little bit at the end of this lecture and then more in the next lecture. But yeah, how do we see neutron stars? Like many things, the process that forms a neutron star is quite complicated and I simplified stuff a lot as usual. So one thing that is happening in a star, we talked about our sun for a little while at least, was that there are a lot of magnetic fields um, that are created by the star. Right? There's all kinds of electrically charged stuff that's just flying around inside of the star. It's like ionized gas or plasma. And the movement of electrically charged things is what creates magnetic fields. So stars generally have tons of magnetic fields and they get more or less intense and that was what we associate with the sun cycle, right? sunspots, and solar flares, and things like that. So there's all these magnetic fields going on. As the star crushes down to become a neutron star, you're sort of like squeezing all those magnetic fields together too. And that squeezing greatly intensifies the strength of those fields. Yeah, so they all sort of kind of get pushed together and in our star, or in most stars, like there could be fairly complicated magnetic fields and things happening, but when they get crushed down so small, you can kind of simplify it and think about it more like the magnetic field of our planet, of Earth, where it pretty much just has a north pole and a south pole, and the kind of magnetic field bends out around from the north pole and into the south pole. Right? So a much simpler magnetic field, now it's all squeezed down, but it's very, very intense, very strong. The other thing that's happening as the star collapses is the rotation is getting greater and greater. And I told you about this a while ago, when something is spinning and you sort of 
pull in the mass of that object, the rate of spin is going to increase. So the example I showed you a while ago was an uh, ice skater. So the ice skater spinning around, their arms out. As they pull their arms in, their rate of spin speeds up, right? the rotation rate, faster and faster. So the same thing happens with stars. Right? Stars are, you know, it seems like a lot of them aren't spinning all that fast. Like our sun takes, I think it was like 20 to 30 days to revolve around. But as it crushes down, that rate speeds up more and more and more and more. And we can actually see this happening. This is a pretty nice little demonstration where the sky is going to spin this sort of ball-like thing. It's like a frame of a sphere. And it's going to spin. It's not going to spin that fast. But when he pulls the core on the bottom, what that does is it forces all the frame to sort of crush in and become a smaller sphere. And by pulling all that mass in around where it's rotating, it's going to spin a lot faster. So we can see that in action it has to do with something called the conservation of angular momentum. All right, so here we go. We've got the sphere spinning. So he pulls that core, it's going to pull it all together, and that spin rate increases quite a lot. Right? Let it all back out, it slows down. But with the neutron star, it's collapsing in on itself, and as it does, that rate of rotation increases and it spins faster and faster. So yeah. The result of this process is that you get an object, or neutron star, that can have incredibly strong magnetic fields and can be spinning very fast. So very fast, meaning these neutron stars can get rotating up to like hundreds of times every second. And given that it's still like 20 kilometers wide, that's a really fast rotation. So more, it's complicated stuff, but the fact that it has these magnetic fields and it's spinning around really fast means that it can generate these beams of electromagnetic radiation which will sort of shoot out of the magnetic poles, right? the north and the south pole. And the last thing to note is that the magnetic poles don't necessarily always align with the rotation of these neutron stars. If you look back at the Earth's magnetic field, right, it has an axis that it's rotating about, and its magnetic poles are actually off that axis. They're not totally aligned. And if you remember in the planets, some of them, they had magnetic fields, and they were very off aligned, right? Some of them were at like 90 degree angles from the rotation. So there's a magnetic poles like along this axis, and it's rotating along this axis. So that is to say that you can end up with a picture or an object sort of like this, where the magnetic fields are indicated by those yellow sort of loops coming out, and the poles are where those loops meet, but the object is rotating about an uh, axis that's not through those poles. And so neutron stars can all uh, form with like their magnetic fields, stronger or weaker, rates of spin, probably gonna be pretty fast. I mean, they're not always going to form with their magnetic fields off the axis like this. But the magnetic fields are strong enough to generate these beams of electromagnetic radiation. So only some neutron stars are going to form into this kind of object, where it has these really intense magnetic fields that form these beams that are not aligned with the way that the neutron star is rotating. So they point in different directions all the time as the star rotates. So we end up with an object that does something like the animation here, right, where those beams sort of sweep out or sweep through the sky. What we see when we look at this kind of object then is every once in a while, one of those beams might shine at us or go right past us. And so it sweeps into our view and we get for a moment that beam of electromagnetic radiation. This is sometimes called like the lighthouse effect because it's similar to what a lighthouse does. Right, where a lighthouse will shine light usually like in two directions and the lens that's focusing that light is just kind of spinning around and so the lighthouse sweeps its light across the horizon. Right? If you're looking at a lighthouse you'll just see like bright light and then dim. Bright light and then dim. Very similar idea here with the pulsar. If we look at this pulsar then it will see bright, bright, bright and that just means this burst of sort of uh, electromagnetic radiation.
So these things, when they were first detected, were detected in the radio part of the spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. So they were called pulsing radio sources or pulsars. Pulsing meaning it's like pulse, pulse. It happens repeatedly. But even though they were first detected in radio, they actually emit or can emit in all parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we can detect them in even like x-ray, in uh, ultraviolet. But yeah, they were just first detected in radio. And as we'll see, the older this kind of thing gets, the more and more it just is emitting in radio. Here we have an example of a pulsar, which is in this thing known as the Crab Nebula. A little bit unfortunate again. Nebula just being this cloud of gas that we saw at some point. It turns out that this nebula is actually the remnant of a supernova. This was the layers of the star that got blown off as a, this sort of massive star with supernova and the core that was left as that neutron star. So not all pulsars are going to look like this. This one still happens to have a decent amount of stuff near it. And so when we look at that area, we can still see the gas that's near it being sort of energized by the energy that the pulsar is giving off. I think the, yeah, both of the images on the left are in the x-ray range, which is pretty energetic electromagnetic radiation. Uh, the one on the right is uh, animation that's sort of made up of multiple observations. And so you can almost see a bit of like this neutron star in the middle is spinning around and as it does it, uh, it's giving off energy and forming these sort of ripples in the gas and such that's still around it. So that's like the center of this crab nebula. Sure exactly, but the images on the left are of a zoomed in area in the center of this crab nebula. So maybe like that thing in there. One of the reasons that this was important is because it gives us good evidence that a supernova can form or can be followed up at least by a pulsar. So this was from supernova 1054, which we've probably referenced a couple of times before and we probably will still reference. It was one that happened in the year 1054 CE and was recorded very precisely by Chinese astronomers at the time. So we know there was a supernova there. Now we're looking at the aftermath some thousand years later. It's another image of a pulsar. It's in the constellation Circinus. Circinus? I'm not familiar with it. But I believe the pulsar is in the sort of upper left area, and the yellowish like gold areas are highly energized gas around the pulsar. So these pulsars are giving off energy, right? But there's no fusion happening inside of the neutron star, right? It's just gravity to crush down to form these neutrons. And the fact that neutrons, like electrons, don't want to overlap their positions. They don't want to be in the same position. And so if you crush them down enough, they start to push back. And that was that degeneracy pressure. In this case, it would be neutron degeneracy pressure. That's the pressure that's pushing back. It's not fusion that's creating energy that's increasing the pressure to push back. So where's the energy that these pulsars are giving off coming from? Basically, it's energy that's being siphoned away from the rotation. So the fact that this object is rotating means it has a certain amount of energy. If it's rotating really fast, there's a lot of energy. That energy is slowly being siphoned away and emitted by these pulsars, which means you're taking energy away from the rotation, the rotation is going to slow down. It takes a good while, like 100 to 100 million years, but in that time, the rate of spin will go from like hundreds of times a second, you know, revolving around hundreds of times a second, to revolving once every like few seconds. Right? So going from to when it's sort of young, still has a lot of rotational energy, and it's still spinning very fast, and these pulsars emit high energy electromagnetic radiation. So anywhere from like x-ray and visible all the way down to radio. When these pulsars have slowed down quite a bit, then they can only emit lower energy electromagnetic radiation, which is basically radio. Radio waves, remember, are like the longest um, 
wavelength electromagnetic radiation, longest wavelength, and they have the lowest energy. Once they slow down enough, we basically can't detect them anymore. Right? Not really emitting much of anything. And again, that takes you know 10 to 100 million years. One other interesting thing that can happen to those high mass stars at the end of their life, right? Forms a neutron star, and if it has intense enough magnetic fields and the magnetic poles are off the rotational axis, then they can form these pulsars. But remember, getting to that neutron star phase at all meant that it went through this supernova, this explosion. Now that process can be uh, messy, right? And so much so that it seems that once in a while, a supernova will sort of happen and it will kick out the core that was left, right? So that supernova goes off, and some, uh, somehow the energy bounces around in such a way that it returns to the core, which is now a neutron star, and knocks it out from where it was. The image here is of such a star. It's a little bit unclear here, but in this image, I'm pretty sure the neutron star, well, that became a pulsar, uh, is sort of at the V of that purple trail and the kind of brighter white or greenish trail, right at the bottom of that V. That's where the uh, neutron star is, and it seems to be that the purple is the trail that it's been leaving as it zooms through the cosmos, right? So it seems that it kind of zoomed in in this direction somehow. And apparently it's moving really fast, uh, two to five million miles per hour. So it got quite a kick out of that supernova. All that stuff uh, I've told you about so far, how you do with the death of stars, was looking at high mass stars, low mass stars. High mass, not too, too high mass, because that's later. But also, these are just sort of single star systems, right? So a system that formed with just one star. Do that partly just because we don't have all the time in the world, and also because binary systems are even more complicated and it's tricky. Don't want to leave them out entirely though, because there are a lot of them. Right? I told you before, those single star systems, like our, our solar system with just one star, the sun, that's only like half of the star systems that form. Right? The other half is a lot of binary, and then some even with three or four or five stars. So we want to talk a little bit at least about what can happen in the end of a life of a star that was part of a binary system. So this is a fairly nice depiction of two stars, right? The star on the far left, we have what they're calling the primary star and the secondary star. Um, the primary one is a bit bigger and a bit more massive, meaning it's going to go through its life cycle quicker. So in the very beginning, both of those stars are main sequence stars. They're giving hydrogen fusion using protons to form helium and create energy. Move over one step there, and the more massive star has gone through its main stage phase already and has already made it to the red giant phase. The secondary star is still on the main sequence, and then go over again. That red giant has finished its red giant phase and pushed off its outer layers to be left with a white dwarf. So this was a low mass star, still less than about eight times the mass of our sun. It was still more massive than the secondary star, so it went through all those phases faster. And the secondary star is still in the main sequence when this one became a white dwarf. Over one more again, that secondary star has finally finished its time on the main sequence. And it's become a red giant. The primary star is still just seeing a white dwarf. It's going to keep doing that for a long, long time. Nothing else happens. And it's at this phase, right, the white dwarf is incredibly dense and has a very large gravitational pull, and so it can start pulling the material from that red giant. If you recall, the white dwarf was that core of like carbon and some oxygen, and it's pulling the outer layers of this red giant, which is hydrogen. So it pulls the hydrogen, and the hydrogen starts to build up in this layer around the white dwarf, and so the hydrogen that gets pulled over is sort of crushed. It's heated up, it's heated up, it's heated up. It starts to pull over enough and that hydrogen gets dense enough and hot enough to about 10 million Kelvin, which is the temperature where hydrogen fusion can begin. And in fact, it's just the sort of layer on the outside of the white dwarf that is very dense and gets up to that 10 million Kelvin, kind of all at once, 
so that that hydrogen all fuses sort of in an instant and blows off. So that sort of explosion is what we just call a nova. And that white dwarf has pulled in a bunch of hydrogen, heated it till it got to that fusion point, and then just fused it all in an almost an instant blows it away. When it fuses all that hydrogen, it basically converts it all to helium and blows it off. Then where we're left with is sort of that red giant remnant, right? This sort of smaller core of that red giant that didn't get pulled over by the white dwarf. And depending on how large the explosion is, it, the white dwarf could still be there. And sometimes there's still enough material of the red giant left that the process can start over from the white dwarf just pulling more material from the red giant and pulling hydrogen probably over and the hydrogen gets denser and denser and hotter and hotter and to the point where it all fuses almost at once to form helium blows away. And you can actually have multiple novas from a single binary system. However, something else can happen too if that white dwarf pulls enough material quick enough. So hopefully you remember we went talking about the cores that are left over after the star has finished its fusion stages. We talked about the cores that are left over from low mass stars ended up being about one and a half times the mass of the sun or less than that, right? That was what was left over after a low mass star. So it shed its outer layers and became a white dwarf. So that cutoff of, I think they have 1.4 times the mass of our sun, around one and a half times the mass of our sun. Right. That cutoff is still important for the white dwarf. So if you have this binary system where there's a white dwarf and a red giant, and that white dwarf is pulling material from the red giant, and it does that fast enough so that it doesn't go nova, it doesn't just use all that stuff and blow it off, it pulls it in quick enough that it actually gets itself over that limit, right, where that white dwarf has now acquired enough material that it's more than 1.4 times the mass of our sun then it has become massive enough to overcome the degeneracy pressure, that electron degeneracy pressure that was holding that white dwarf up from collapsing in under gravity. But if it acquires enough mass quick enough to cross that limit, then gravity can overtake that electron degeneracy pressure again and crush down that white dwarf, and in doing so, greatly increase the temperature of that core enough that you actually can fuse carbon. That crushing down of the core and that heating up to the temperature to fuse carbon, I can't recall, it's some like billion degrees or something like that. Um, but that can happen on cosmic time scales very quickly. That crushing down only takes about 100 years, it seems, which is like a blink of an eye on cosmic time scales. So that white dwarf requires enough material from the red giant, it crosses over that threshold of being about one and a half times uh, the mass of the sun. Gravity wit starts to win again, crushes that core down to the point where carbon can fuse, and nearly all of that carbon fuses almost like in an instant. As you might guess, all that fusion happening very quickly leads to a very large explosion. So this is another kind of supernova. It's what we call type 1A supernova. And it's an intense enough event that it tends to just obliterate the white dwarf. It passes that threshold, it fuses carbon, and goes Supernova, there's pretty much going to be no white dwarf left after that. The whole thing blows away. But blowing away means the stuff that was there that was fused just kind of gets spreads out back into the interstellar medium. And you see the interstellar medium with more elements to form new stars and planets. So this was an image of one such supernova, type 1A, that happened, it looks like in 2014, in this galaxy M82, sometimes called the Cigar Galaxy, which is a fairly close to our galaxy, 11.5 million light years. In terms of the universe, it's pretty close. So the galaxy is the big picture, and then if you look closely there, the inset is this uh, supernova. It's a little speck that got real bright for a bit. Beyond just being sort of an interesting event, it can happen in binary systems with sort of average stars, right? Most stars are low mass stars, and both of those stars in the scenario I told you about are low mass stars. So it's a reasonably regularly occurring kind of thing. It becomes very nice because these type 1A supernova happen in sort of a reliable way. When they happen, 
right? The amount of energy that gets put off is usually pretty similar, or about the same. Uh, the peak in the brightness of these things is about the same, which makes it a very useful kind of thing. Right. The energy output and the peak luminosity are pretty consistent for these type 1a supernovas. And they're generally brighter than most type 2 supernovas, right, when the neutron star is formed. Up to five times as bright as those, which means we can see them even further away than those type 2 supernovas. So why is that a useful thing? Well, if I see a type 1a supernova, then I measure its apparent brightness, right? How bright it looks on Earth. If I also know pretty much how bright it actually got, its actual luminosity, then recall you have apparent brightness and luminosity, we can calculate its distance from us. So this is why uh, these type 1a supernovas are sometimes referred to as a standard candle. I think there are a couple of things in astronomy that are referred to as standard candles, but the name is to imply that like, this is a thing that I know how bright it is, right? So when I look out into the cosmos and I see it, it's apparent brightness basically it can tell me how far away it is. So the image on the left there is showing, you know, just a regular candle, or you could think about like a bulb, sometimes it's called standard light bulb too. But if I have this candle and it has very consistent brightness, then the further away it is, the dimmer it gets. So by how dim it actually is, I can tell how far away it is. Then on the left side, that image, you have like galaxies further and further away, and the bright spots are like these type 1a supernovas going off. And they get dimmer and dimmer as you get further away. But again, since I know the peak brightness of a type 1a supernova, that means I know how bright those things actually are. So how dim they appear, along with how bright they are, tells me how far away they are. It's a very useful thing on that cosmic distance ladder that I told you about before. And I think we'll probably come back to this maybe more when we talk about you know, galaxies in the universe, the large sort of scale of the universe. Two other things that can happen with binary systems, just want to mention. But one is say that you have uh, binary system where one of the stars was a high mass star, the other star was maybe just a regular low mass star, and so the high mass star goes through all its life cycles a lot quicker and gets to the end of its life, it goes supernova, type 2 supernova, and forms a neutron star. And there are ways, scenarios, where the companion star still survived that supernova. Right? It's not always going to survive. The supernova might kind of obliterate the other star. But sometimes, these other stars survive. In that case, we have a similar setup to the one before, where we had like a white dwarf and this other secondary star, and eventually the material from that secondary star starts to get pulled to the more denser um, neutron star, in this case, that's left over. So the neutron star starts to pull the material from its companion. A similar thing happens then where that material gets pulled into the neutron star, it gets crushed, it gets really, really hot, and eventually heated to the point of fusion. Most of it fuses pretty much in an instant and gets blown away. So we can get these explosions in that fashion. There's another option where you end up with two neutron stars in a system, right? So we have two high mass stars that formed a binary system. They've both gone through all the stages of their life cycles, they've gone supernova, somehow they've each survived the supernova that the other produced before it turned into a neutron star. But we get to the point where we have two neutron stars in a binary system. But we're going to talk about space-time more later for our understanding of the connection to space and time. But for now, I can say that these two neutron stars are so dense uh, and so massive that their orbit around each other, the movement of them around each other, actually disrupts the fabric of space-time. And basically, it sort of sends off energy through space-time, right? And doing that by creating what we now call gravity waves, or gravitational waves. And then just orbiting each other doesn't produce very large gravitational waves, but it does give off some gravitational energy. Being that it gives off energy, the size of that orbit is just slowly shrinking, slowly, slowly shrinking, until eventually, those 
two neutron stars are going to merge. And that merging can produce a large explosion, a fairly bright thing, something that's brighter than the nova, which was produced by the white dwarf that fused a bunch of hydrogen in its outer shell, but not quite as bright as a supernova generally, so that gets termed a kilonova, in between nova and supernova. We're going to get too much into the details of that one, so I think we'll come back to that sort of event when we talk more about space-time. So the last topic in this chapter, in this lecture, has to do with something called gamma-ray bursts, and leads us kind of into the next chapter. So what is this sort of mystery that was going on? Well, in like the 1960s, apparently, the U.S. was real worried that other countries were going to violate uh, treaties that had been signed uh, that said nobody was going to detonate nukes in outer space. Of course, we need treaties for that. So the U.S. wanted to be sure that this was this treaty was being followed. So they basically developed a spacecraft that could measure gamma rays. So they put this thing up in orbit, and they wanted to measure gamma rays because gamma rays get produced by nuclear explosions. So if you detonate nuclear material, you're going to let out gamma rays. And it's pretty hard to stop all that gamma radiation leaving a particular location, so if you're far away, you can probably still detect the gamma radiation that was produced in a nuclear explosion in order to say, well, somebody was exploding some nukes around here. That was the idea anyway. It turned out that they didn't find anybody violating this treaty. What they did detect, however, were bursts of gamma radiation. Right? So it was like all these gamma rays just kind of hit the detector over a short period of time, and it was done. It turns out that this was some of the first stuff that we actually measured that came from outside of our galaxy. And also, it is some of the most energetic events in the universe that produce these gamma ray bursts. But we didn't know all that at first. What we did find out fairly quickly was that these gamma ray bursts were coming from all over the place. I mean, they weren't just coming from, like, the Milky Way galaxy. Because most of the stuff in the Milky Way make, is made up of the disk of the Milky Way, right? That, like, spiral. They weren't coming just from that spiral, they were coming from everywhere in the sky. And the disk, you can see the disk at night sometimes, right? Across over the sky, it looks like a dark black cloud at night. Being that they came from all over the place, sort of had two ideas of like where they could be coming from. So if they're not coming from the disk of the galaxy, they may be coming from the halo of our galaxy. I've mentioned this before, but the Milky Way is basically this big spinning kind of pinwheel disk but there is some uh, material that's still bound to the uh, galaxy that makes up these sort of like bulbs on top and below the disk of the galaxy. So those are like bulbs, what we call the halos of our galaxy, right? Here, down here. And those surround us all over the place, right? So one thought was that there could be things, events, that are creating these gamma ray bursts, and they're in the galactic halo. And being that we're measuring them, they need to be, you know, fairly bright. The other option, though, is that these bursts were coming from very far away. Basically, the only other place where things are sort of evenly distributed around us is the rest of the universe. There's galaxies in all directions from us. If that's the case, though, these things that we're seeing from distant galaxies need to be extremely bright, incredibly energetic. So we were pretty sure that they were coming from the galactic halo, there's not really a whole lot going on there, and so we started hunting for the sources of these gamma ray bursts in distant galaxies. Uh, I just wanted to note, too, that we talked about this a lot, quite a while ago now, but ground-based telescopes wouldn't be able to measure these gamma ray bursts. If you look back at one of the earlier lectures when I talked about electromagnetic radiation and trying to look at it through our atmosphere, there are only certain portions of the electromagnetic spectrum that make it through our atmosphere. The rest of them are absorbed by the atmosphere, so they never get down to the ground. Uh, gamma radiation happens to be one that is absorbed by our atmosphere, so it doesn't make it through. This is why we go to space to actually measure these things. It's very nice that it doesn't get through because gamma radiation is the highest energy electromagnetic radiation. It should be quite dangerous if our atmosphere didn't stop all that stuff. So this is an illustration of the measurements of these gamma ray bursts that were coming just from all over the sky. The 
picture on the left there is the Space Telescope, or sometimes called the Observatory, Compton Gamma Ray Observatory in this case, uh, that was created to look for these bursts. And the picture on the right is something like pictures we've seen before, where this is like the whole sky looking out, but you sort of split it and press it down to the splat space. And in this picture, the center line, or the middle of that uh, ellipse, is aligned with the disk of the Milky Way. So if this was a visible image, then we would see like the disk of the Milky Way in the middle here, and then outside the Milky Way above, and sort of below there. It's not on there though, this is just the whole sky, and the fact that there are dots basically everywhere means that these gamma ray bursts are coming from all directions. And they're also sort of color-coded to longer bursts or shorter bursts, but again, there's not really a pattern in the colors either, right? meaning how long or how short these bursts are doesn't seem to be oriented or specific to any location in the sky either. So it took a good while from measuring the first gamma ray bursts to spotting a possible source of one of these bursts, but eventually we were able to do that, and one of the first ones was in 1997, I think there were actually two in that year, 1997. Yeah, so it was Charles stuff for a while because these detectors that we were making to measure the gamma ray bursts didn't necessarily have the ability to look in other ranges of the spectrum, like invisible or infrared. And so for a while there was an issue of like a gamma ray burst would be detected, and then like some scientists, some astronomers, would have to go and tell these other astronomers at like the ground-based telescope that it does like visible light to look in that part of the sky, right? And try to see if there's anything else there, right? Because the only gamma ray burst came from like that area, but we want to see what else is in that area. So eventually we got our sort of act together and came up with a system where like the space-based telescope would measure the gamma ray bursts and it could point to it fairly nicely. And then we automated this whole thing where it's like computers talking to computers. And then the ground-based telescope could then pretty quickly point to that area. And so we can start to actually see what is called like the afterglow of these gamma ray bursts. And so there you go, this was one of them. On the left is you know, zoomed out, on the right you can zoom all the way in, and that just center sort of clump is a whole galaxy. Right? And that spot they're indicating is the source of the gamma ray burst, just on some sort of outer edge of that galaxy. And using some other techniques that I don't think we've talked about yet, but we'll talk about later, I think, in talking about large-scale things in the universe, but we can calculate roughly the distance that galaxy is away from us. It turns out it's about 8 billion light years away. That's starting to get pretty darn far. I told you earlier we looked at a galaxy that was like 11, 11 and a half million light years away. You know, it's far, but it's still in sort of our galactic neighborhood. 8 billion light years is a thousand times further than that galaxy was. This is getting very far away, which is just kind of crazy because we're seeing some event that produced enough energy that was still bright enough 8 billion light years away for us to see. Like we can see that whole galaxy, but it's just this little kind of dim thing. There's some kind of event that happened that was bright enough for us to see 8 billion light years away. So what kinds of things lead to that phenomenal amount of energy? Maybe these gamma ray bursts that we can see across the universe. Two of the things that we think can create these gamma ray bursts are the merging of neutron stars, which I told you about a little bit earlier, and also the last stages of these very massive stars. So when I was talking about neutron stars, remember I said like eight solar masses up to like 10 solar masses. 10 solar masses and greater though, we start to get even stranger things happening. And the end of a star's life, which started out as like 10 times the mass of our sun or more than that, can lead to these very large bursts of gamma radiation, and what we think is the birth of a black hole. So the merging of the neutron stars can generate these gamma ray bursts, though they're apparently not like terribly large or intense bursts, and they're much shorter in a few seconds. Whereas the end stage of these really massive stars will generate really large bursts 
gamma ray bursts, and they can last a bit longer, typically about a minute. So I should note, though, that these kinds of things generate like crazy amounts of energy. Right? They make these bursts of gamma radiation, so much so that we can see them like across the universe. However, there was no like theory or there was no model for how anything could make this much energy, as much energy in some of these gamma ray bursts, if that energy spread out uh, equally, right? It just blew out in all directions, right? like a standard kind of explosion. So part of our modeling of these events, what we think has to happen, is similar to like the energy emitted from the pulsars, right? These events happen and these gamma ray bursts are generated, but they only go out of like the poles of these objects. So this is why in this illustration you have sort of a depiction or a representation maybe of like what a gamma ray burst might look like. This isn't an actual picture. Um, I think the nebula behind it is a real nebula, but it's been embellished and we've added these like beams of gamma radiation. So you have this uh, maybe like a collapse of a really massive star, like greater than 10 times the mass of our sun, collapse in there to form a black hole and in the process shoot out these beams of gamma radiation. So since they're only going into beams, when we see them, those are only the ones where those beams are pointed in our direction. And so a lot of the time, it's one of these events happening, right, it's not necessarily going to point those gamma ray bursts in our direction. Most of the time it's probably not. So that kind of tells us that, you know, we're only seeing a small percentage probably of the amount of these events that create gamma ray bursts. The last thing I say, and I mentioned this a little bit earlier, we're talking about the merging of neutron stars, but also in the creation of black holes, and in the merging of maybe black holes and neutron star, merging of black holes. These events are so intense that they create ripples in space-time, or you can think about space and time. They're actually two parts of the same thing. But that gets us into thinking about space as like a fabric that stretches, which makes up part of the basis of what we call general relativity, and I think that's about what we're going to get to next time. So, that's it, and I will see you later.